pounds. We are very excited. The Division of Hospital Medicine is presenting its second CPC for Grand Rounds, a clinical pathologic case conference. We're very excited because it's an unknown case and the working group has gone to great pains to make sure that the speaker knows nothing about the diagnosis. So I'm actually going to turn this over to Ramon Longa, who heads our working group for the division, identifying cases, putting those together, finding speakers, and really orchestrating a great session. So looking forward to it. All right. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, so uh, I'm going to introduce a couple of things, you know. So the first thing I'm going to do is uh, just let you guys know that if you can sign in to this pollseverywhere.com, which uh, you're going to text HMS CPC 492 to this number 22333, and that will log you in. It will give you a message that, hey, you have logged in to Pulse Everywhere or signed in, and then you can free text your response after Dr. Katakam's presentation, after the case is presented. So uh, with that, I'll go back to... Uh, Dr. Karakam, who's going to be our presenter for today, and uh, she uh, completed her residency in University of Florida and then uh, went on to complete her residency in University of Maryland and then joined Emory back in 2015. A vibrant, efficient hospitalist, uh, serves as an assistant professor in our division, and uh, we're going to have the pleasure of having Harita take the case. Yes, HMS CPC 492. I can show you back maybe. Sorry. Number is 22333. And we are keeping the uh, consultants, you know, information concealed at this point, uh, just to keep it. Keep it interesting, you know, so here you go. All right, thank you. All right, thank you, Ramon. Can you guys hear me okay? All right, so let's get started with the case. So the patient is a 63-year-old male presenting with severe low back pain, which has been worsening over the last month. He describes the pain as dull and throbbing in character and non-radiating. And he also notes some associated symptoms of intermittent fevers, night sweats, and a weight loss of approximately 100 pounds over the last one to two months. The patient denies any sensory abnormalities and no urinary or fecal incontinence. He complains of pain with active movement or standing, and he's been having some difficulty walking and performing his ADLs. Past medical and surgical history significant for hypertension, a history of TIA versus stroke approximately six months prior to admission, and he has no residual deficits. He also had a colonoscopy approximately six weeks prior to admission. He had multiple polyps removed, mostly tubular adenomas, um, and one polyp did show low-grade adenocarcinoma. Social history, the patient had been working as a truck technician until his back pain started. He's single, not sexually active, and lives with his daughter. He had a brother who died from TB approximately five years ago and he had some intermittent close contact with him at that time. Review of systems, um, primarily positive for what we had mentioned before, fevers, fevers, night sweats, weight loss. Um, he had no sore throat, no dysphagia, no cardiac or respiratory symptoms, no GI symptoms. He denied any joint pains or muscle aches, had no rashes. Um, for neuro review of systems, no headache, vision changes, no focal weakness or sensory loss, and no bruising or bleeding and no swollen glands. On physical exam, the patient's temperature was 37.9, Tmax was 38.7 degrees Celsius, blood pressure 152 over 66, heart rate 108, respiratory rate 18, and setting 96% on room air. The patient was well appearing on exam, um, no acute distress. He had no scleral icterus on ENT exam with normal conjunctiva, clear oropharynx, moist mucous membranes, no temporal wasting. He did have many missing teeth. 
Um, on his neck exam was supple, no thyromegaly or no lymphadenopathy were appreciated. On cardiac exam, he had a rapid rate and rhythm and a two out of six systolic ejection murmur heard at the apex and left sternal border. No JVD and two plus distal pulses. He was breathing comfortably, had good air movement on his lung exam and no wheezes or ronchi were appreciated. Um, the patient's abdominal exam, um, it's not, he was soft, non-tender, non-distended, had bowel sounds present, no guarding, rebound, masses, or rigidity were noted. On his back exam, the patient did have tenderness to palpation over the L-spine. Um, on musculoskeletal exam, he had normal bulk and tone, no clubbing or cyanosis, and no lower extremity edema. The patient's skin was warm, dry, and intact with no rashes. On neuro exam, he had no focal deficits. His cranial nerves were grossly intact. Strength was five out of five and symmetric throughout. Deep tendon reflexes were one plus at the knee and ankles bilaterally, and his Babinski was negative. So initial labs. Um, so his BMP was fairly unremarkable. Um, I'll kind of go through the numbers. Sodium 134, potassium 4. Uh, chloride 96, his bicarb was 27, BUN 19, creatinine 1.06, glucose 132. His white count was 10 with uh, neutrophils 81%, 12% lymphocytes and 7% monos, hemoglobin of 9.7, hematocrit 30.1, platelets 375. AST was 23, ALT 10, ALKFOS 124, t billy 1.6, protein 8.4, albumin 3.5, and INR 1.2. His UA was pretty bland other than showing a protein of 200 milligrams per deciliter. So initial management of a patient, he was admitted to the hospital for pain control for his back pain and he had an MRI of the spine ordered. He also had a chest X-ray which did not show any acute findings. So um, we'll go over the imaging a little bit here. So the patient, uh, we picked out two images to show you guys. So the first one is a sagittal T1 image, which is post-contrast. So you can see that there's some um, enhancement here in L1 and L2. He also has some vertebral end, end plate hyperintensity, which is typically seen with osteomyelitis and discitis. Um, the second image that we have is an axial um, T2 image, and it's fluid sensitive. And you can basically see that the spinal canal is intact, but he does have some um, increased enhancement over here on the right side in the paraspinal musculature. So this kind of goes over what I just described to you guys, so I'll leave that there. He also had an MRI of the abdomen and pelvis, which showed a cystic lesion in his liver, which was suggestive of a complex bile duct hamartoma and some cholelithiasis without cholecystitis and prostatomegaly. On hospital day two, the patient complained of some left ankle pain. He had left ankle swelling, erythema, and warmth noted on exam, and his x-ray did not show any acute abnormalities. Oh, it's not showing up. Good? Uh, so his joint was tapped, had 444 nucleated cells with presence of monosodium urate crystals. So additional testing that was done, um, the patient had a urine protein check like we talked about earlier. His urine creatinine was 153 milligrams per deciliter. He had negative HIV, hepatitis, and uh, quant gold. His folate was 10, ferritin was elevated at 1,056, B12 was um, elevated at 1,886, TSH was 1.8, and his RPR was reactive with a titer of 1 to 2. So then he had some additional diagnostic studies performed that we'll get to later. So now we're going to go back to our poll. So let's see. So Ramon told you guys earlier you can text HMS CPC 492 um, to 22333. And then once you join, you can free text your response, and we want to know what is the most likely diagnosis that you guys are thinking about right now. They're showing up? Yeah, here. Big reveal after we get more responses. 
So I'm trying to encourage you guys to do it. All right, so I'm going to introduce um, our discussant for the case today, who is uh, Dr. David Krakow. Dr. Krakow is an assistant professor of medicine um, and director of hospital medicine at EUH and UWASH, and he's been doing that since 2014. He went to medical school at University of Miami in Florida and Beth Israel Deaconess for residency. Um, he's received multiple teaching awards, including three uh, Department of Medicine Golden Apple Teaching Awards and two Outstanding Hospital Medicine Teaching Awards. Um, and we all know him well, and he's been leading his Krakow Conference monthly since 2010. So let's welcome Dr. David Krakow. Thanks, Aretha. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, this was an interesting case. So I started with, um, I went through the whole case and I created my differential, but I thought it'd be interesting to explain every abnormality. So here's all, here's the problem list with the, the main abnormalities. And I'm going to talk about some of these later. But I, want, I think, you know, whenever you're faced with a case, you want to try to explain everything, at least have a, a differential of your top three for every abnormality in order of likelihood. Don't just blow off findings. I think it's helpful um, to have some idea of what it might be. I think uh, in clinical medicine, sometimes we're so busy seeing patients. Uh, you might see hypokalemia in the morning, and you're, you just replete the K, but you don't think about the cause of the hypo K. So anyway, here, here are some abnormalities, and we'll talk more about them. So I kind of started with my differential. What do I think is going on here? And I'll explain my, my rationale, but I think this is going to be subacute bacterial endocarditis with a bacterial osteomyelitis at the L1, L2 disc. Um, so why is that? Well, if you think about it, the patient's been sick for about one to two months, um, and then they had a colonoscopy six weeks ago. Now, I don't know. What's, what would be interesting is the timing of the symptoms. He's lost 100 pounds. He's had night sweats and fevers for, again, one to two months colonoscopy was somewhere in that one to two month range. I'm told it's six weeks ago, so it would be critical to know, did that, I mean, you, you want to take that history, did it actually, how did he feel the day of the colonoscopy? Did he feel, feel well? I mean, that's going to be key. If he started to feel poorly two or three days after the colonoscopy, well, it actually makes the diagnosis a little bit easier. And we're, we're told on that colonoscopy that he had um, colon cancer. So as we know, colon cancer is associated with strep bovis bacteremia. And one way to kind of tie it all together would be um, he gets a biopsy. He gets bloodstream infection from the strep bovis. He seeds the valve. So he develops endocarditis, let's say, within a few days of that procedure. And then with the history that I get, he developed severe back pain, I'm told, a month before presentation, which would fit perfectly one to two weeks after the colonoscopy, he then gets back pain. So one way to tie it together would be colon cancer, he has the, the biopsy, he gets bacteremia, it gets endocarditis, and, uh, and then within a week or two seeds is back, and that's the story. <laughs> so, um, you know, they threw in that red herring of the brother with TB. I thought that was interesting. Uh, he does have that exposure. The quantiferon gold is negative. We all know that quantiferon gold or PPDs do not rule out TB, active TB, but it does make it less likely. 
So you have your a priori probability, you do your test, with, which is the quantifier on gold, the test is negative, the likelihood of TB is lower. It doesn't exclude the diagnosis, but it's lower. Usually about 80% of patients with active TB will still have a positive PPD. It's probably even higher with a, with a quantifier on gold. So if he had TB, it would have to be that 20%. And then you say to yourself, well, why would he just develop TB and colon cancer? You know, it just, to me, it seems uh, much less likely than using our common sense and connecting this procedure to the endocarditis and, and discitis. Now, if he had, um, I'm going to talk about it in, in, a, in a couple of slides forward, but I would think strep ovus would be the most likely here. That's one of the causes of endocarditis. Um, there's multiple variants, which we'll talk about, but it, that's the one clearly asso associated with um, colon cancer and endocarditis. There's four types. We'll do it on the next slide. Enterococcus just being more common. That's a more common cause of endocarditis than strep ovus, so it still has to be considered. He did have the colonoscopy. I think less likely would be viridins. He did have the missing teeth, but we don't know the, the quality of the teeth. They're, maybe they're just missing. People without teeth and who floss that have teeth have lower incidence of endocarditis than people with poor teeth. Morantic, he does have the colon cancer. Coag negative staph. Staph aureus, I think, is unlikely because it's been going on too long. I think be, he'd be dead by now if it was staph aureus endocarditis. I mentioned a few other ones as well. It's also possible he just has the discitis without endocarditis, but I think that's less likely. He just seems too sick for that. But that would be my second most likely diagnosis. Same pathophys, he got back to remic and seeded um, his disc. And then I just mentioned another differential, so I'd have at least three things. But it's not this, you know, a perineoplastic fever with colon cancer, something called Stouffer syndrome. Could that biliary, biliary hematoma actually be a met? That's described. And I, this is just describing some of, the, some of my thought process, which I've already talked about. Again, it's going to be critical. When did the symptoms start? Was it before or after that colonoscopy? That'll be key. I thought it was kind of weird. If, he had, if he's had endocarditis for six weeks, why doesn't he have some of the other systemic symptoms that you would see with endocarditis for having it for that long? No arthralgias, no myalgias, no stigmata of SBE, the Janeway lesions, which are vascular emboli, the Osler nodes, which are... That's the immunological one where the de deposits of the immunoglobulins, no splinter hemorrhages, no petechiae, no splenomegaly on the, on the MRI. So that bothered me a little bit for the diagnosis, but that's okay. I, I still think it's most likely, but it moved me a little bit to the left in terms of likelihood. Thought about TB like we talked about. I just don't think that's what we're dealing with. And the disc that they showed, the images, the disc was not involved, although the radiologist read it as involving the disc. Now, TB can involve just the end plates and not the disc. So then I'm like, huh, could it be TB? That kind of bothered me a little bit, too. So TB, so my third most likely is TB. Um, and then I just talked about some of the other things. The negative quantifier on gold, again, moves your post-test probability a little bit to the left there. Um, but it certainly does not exclude. So strep bovis, we all know the, uh, that we've learned in medical school the association with strep bovis and endocarditis. And in, about 10 years ago, they redid the, um, the naming, the nomenclature of it. So uh, there's four types. The one that actually causes endocarditis is uh, strep gal galaticus. And uh, I think that this patient has strep galaticus, endocarditis, and osteomyelitis discitis. The end, so what's also interesting is some of these streps are associated with colon cancer. There's some, some thought that they actually augment the growing and they help propagate the um, development of the colon cancer. And that's more likely with these three. But Galacticus has a, it's, um, it's encapsulated, so it's more likely to cause endocarditis than the others. So he mentioned a systolic ejection murmur. So when I think about endocarditis, I'm most worried about regurgitin murmurs. You know, MR, AI would be the main ones. Also PR, if it's the pulmonic valve and tricuspid regurg. When I think systolic ejection, you know, I think of the classification of early systolic, mid-systolic, which is the systolic ejection murmur. That's the classic AS murmur, uh, crescendo, decrescendo. But so if you're only hearing it at the apex in the left sternal border, that is not aortic stenosis. Aortic stenosis is heard throughout the entire precordium. So this murmur is not consistent with AS. Could it be an innocent murmur? 
We all talk about flow murmurs and innocent murmurs, and I think we don't use that term appropriately. Um, I think of an innocent murmur as left sternal border, less than two out of six, and when you stand up, the intensity goes down. But if you're hearing a murmur throughout the precordium, I don't think it's innocent, it's actually guilty. In other words, you're gonna find something on your echocardiogram. Um, other causes of a, so this systolic ejection murmur in that location is kind of unusual because if it's MR, I'd expect a holosystolic murmur, maybe an early systolic, systolic murmur if it's acute MR. I mentioned some other causes of, um, of a mid-systolic or a systolic ejection murmur, aortic sclerosis, hokum, and an ASD, we forget, that's from blood in, aug augmented blood flow across the pulmonic valve. It's not the, it's not the blood throwing, flowing through the, the ASD, it's actually increased blood flow and then you get more across the pulmonic valve. So I just talked about some of these things. One way you could sort out the murmur would be do a, do a hand grip. Remember, you have to do it for 60 seconds, and the murmur should augment if it's MR, so I'd be interested in that. Um, didn't have AI on exam, aortic regurgitation, but did, did have the large pulse pressure, which you can see with AI, and he had the positive RPR, which I'll talk about later. Could he have tertiary syphilis and, and aortitis and then result in aortic regurgitation, which would put him at risk for endocarditis. But uh, again, no other stigmata of SVE. Patient had uh, 1.5 grams of protein on their urine protein to creatinine ratio. Um, that to me has a similar differential to nephrotic syndrome. And I listed all the causes of, nef of a pure nephrotic syndrome. And then remember, let's make the difference between RPG and nephritic versus nephrotic. This patient had no evidence of nephritic. In other words, the urine was bland. There were no cast dysmorphic red cells and he didn't have acute renal failure. So he, then you wonder if he has um, one of these diseases here. And I just, I'm just talk, you know, talked a little bit about the meaning of the protein to creatinine ratio. Remember, it's a unitless number in this patient, it's 1.5. That implies that if you do a, did a 24 hour urine, you would have 1.5 grams of urinary protein excreted. Um, the other interesting thing, because he had a gamma globulin gap, could this be myeloma? He had the protein, but the dipstick was 200 protein. That di the dipstick on the UA measures albumin. So if, if it was overflow proteinuria from, let's say, Ben's Jones from a, a high serum-free light chain, then you would see a discordance. You would see maybe trace protein on the UA dipstick, but at an elevated level on the protein to creatinine ratio. That would go for more of a Ben's Jones proteinuria, but he doesn't have that. His, his urinary concentration was 200. So that, that looks like it's, uh, it's albumin that's being excreted. So why would he have proteinuria? Well, here's the differential of um, nephrotic range protein urea. Again, he's subnephrotic, but this is the list. This is about 98% of all causes of a pure nephrotic. In other words, you don't have renal failure. So notice membranous, where you have a thickening of the base of the membrane. So membranous is a highly associated with neoplasm, adenocarcinoma. So he could have protein urea from his long stand, from his colon cancer. I've had patients like that. You take out the colon cancer, and the protein urea goes away. So I think that that's the cause. Now, if he has GN. Let's say he has um, endocarditis. That can also cause glomerular nephritis, but you'd get more of the nephritic. You'd have more of an active sediment. And that would be, if you did the kidney biopsy, you'd see that lumpy bumpy. You know, you've seen the immunofluorescence where the green, as opposed to the linear of glomerular basement membrane, you'd see the lumpy bumpy, which is what you could see in lupus as an example. So I think that he has proteinuria from his colon cancer. I don't think it's from the endocarditis, because again, he doesn't have an active sediment. So, also had some cholestasis. When I, when I interpret liver enzymes, I always compare ALT, AST versus ALKFAS. I don't look at the billy, and I see which one is pr predominantly higher. Well, in his case, it was all ALKFAS and billy. So he had a cholestatic differential. I mean, it wasn't that high, but if we're gonna go through the differential, why would that be? Here's your list, your complete list of the cholestatic differential diagnosis. You know, anatomic, PSC, PBC, infiltrative, um, but one thing that was interesting is that his urine bilirubin on the UA was negative. So the urine bilirubin on, on UA, that measures direct bilirubin in the bloodstream. So his was negative. That implies that his bilirubin at 1.6 is almost all indirect. And if it's indirect, you know, why, what's the differential of an indirect hyperbilirubin? It could be Gilbert syndrome. It could be bleeding. He has bleeding in the hamartoma. Could he be bleeding from the colon cancer? 
maybe that's why. The alk is a little bit up. You can see that just from being sick. But if that mass in the liver, that hamartoma, was actually a met instead, you could have a slightly elevated alk from that. But that said, we see sick people all the time with these mild LFT abnormalities, and it might just be nothing. So then he had the, prime, the positive RPR, which was interesting. I think that you can see a, positive, a false positive RPR from endocarditis. I think that's the answer here. I think that's why it has the one to two. But I thought it'd be interesting just to go through the differential of a positive RPR. First, we'll talk about syphilis. So as you know, primary syphilis, the initial, secondary comes later. Latent is, is at least one year after your secondary syphilis when you're asymptomatic by definition. We separate that into early and late, late being more than one year after you have, have had secondary syphilis. And then tertiary means symptomatic late. And the two forms of symptomatic, well, there's three forms, gummatous, which is also known as benign. That's where you just get diffused gummas throughout the body because mimic a mass lesion in the liver or your skin. Aortitis, which could come into play in this patient. They can get aortic insufficiency. Um, and then late neurosyphilis, we think about uh, paresis, general paresis, which is encephalitis and tabes dorsalis. Wanted to make the point, some people think neurosyphilis equals tertiary syphilis. Not true. You, you can have neurosyphilis from day one of syphilis, and I'll talk about that right now. So neurosyphilis, there's five forms, and um, syphilitic usually happens, so you get meningitis, usually with secondary. Meningovascular uh, happens usually a few years after and can present with a stroke. Sometimes these patients have headaches and signs of meningitis for a few weeks and then they have a stroke. It's just interesting. He had a stroke six months ago and he has the RPR. It's probably not that, but I thought that was an interesting correlation. Tabes dorsalis, that's the spinal cord. Remember, they get the Argyle Robertson pupils where they react to light, but they, um, or they don't react to light. You shine the light, the pupils don't, don't constrict, but they do accommodate. So I usually just put pearl in my notes. I never do perla because there's nothing in medicine where you, can, where, you can, where you constrict, but you don't accommodate. That doesn't exist. There's no pathological lesion that does that. So just for the med students, you never really have to do perla. You can just do pearl. Unless they don't you know, constrict, then you want to do your, your A. Maybe you'll diagnose them with Argyle Robertson. So then I'm just talking about uh, you know, treponema in the setting. Remember spirochetes, it's BLT or your spirochetes. Recurrent fever, Lyme disease, that's Borrelia, Burgdorferia, leptospira, and treponema. Those are your, your spirochetes. And then syphilis is a T. pallidum subspecies pallidum. But then don't forget about yaws, vegil, and pinta. You guys know about that, right? So those are endemic in third world countries. They uh, affect bone and skin. They, they form these destructive lesions. And, uh, but they don't have the tertiary form. They don't have neuro or cardiovascular involvement. But the point is, just going through the whole differential of a positive RPR, they give you positive RPR and the positive FTA, ABS. So this patient, I think it's uh, the RPR is from his endocarditis, but he needs a syphilis antibody, a treponemal antibody, an FTA, ABS. If that's positive, you actually have to, th then by definition, if you don't find disease elsewhere, then he has latent syphilis. And he would, you might have to consider an LP in him to evaluate for neurosyphilis because you don't know how long it's been there, that RPR. So then I just have some other explanations of things. So the gout I thought was unusual. It happened on hospital day two, but they tapped him. He only had 444 cells. Usually with gout, it's an inflammatory arthritis. It has 10 to 50,000 cells. Also consider, could this be a septic arthritis? from the endocarditis, but again, only 444 cells with a septic arthritis, you'd expect about 50,000 cells. So it's still probably gout, but it just bothered me a little bit that there were only 444 cells. The ferritin, about 1,000, probably just acute phase react, and the B12 was very high. He's probably taking supplements, but polycythemia vera, one of the old criteria was a very high B12 level. And again, the gamma globulin gap, I think this is just from the chronic infection. If you checked in SPEP, he'd have a hypergamma globulinemia I doubt he has myeloma. Um, whenever you see that, you check HIV, you check Hep C if you don't have an obvious infection. So he's HIV negative. I assume that's the antibody. Remember, we use the fourth generation test now. That incorporates P24 in the antibody. So these tests usually, from onset of infection to positive test, would be four weeks most of the time. Very rarely it takes two or three months. 
and we don't suspect any acute HIV if you did, if he was presenting two weeks after you check a viral load. Um, just wanted to mention the hepatitis panel was negative. Remember, the acute hepatitis panel at Emory does not include the hep B core IgG. So if you're going to start somebody on immunosuppressive therapy, you always want to make sure you get an IgG core antibody because they could have old hep B and you won't pick it up at all on the, on the acute panel. And then uh, you put them on immunosuppression and they reactivate. So the quantiferon goal was interesting, and I thought that was like maybe the red herring, could this be TB? But um, just to describe the, the test, it's better than the PPD because PPD use no, uses non-mycobacterial, uh, not, I'm sorry, non-tuberculous uh, uh, mycobacterium antigens where the, the quantiferon gold only uses mycobacteria, uses only tuberculous antigens. So, it's less, it's more specific. A positive test is more specific, and you don't have to worry about the vaccine. So I think this is just, I don't think he has TB. So again, back to my differential. I'm going to say this is subacute bacterial endocarditis complicated by L1, L2 discitis caused by strep bovis or even more specifically strep galacticus. And... Um, just to round it out, TB I think is unlikely. Spinal gout is well described and is on the differential. I thought about it because he looks so very well. So I thought that's a possibility, very, very low on the list. And brucella is acquired by ingesting um, unpasteurized milk or cheese or traveling overseas. No risk factors for that. I don't think it's fungal either. How would I treat this patient? Get three blood cultures, you know, hopefully within six to 12 hours. Check a CRP. It's going to help you monitor therapy. Order the CT-guided biopsy. Send for the usual. If it's chalky material for gout, you would send it for crystals. Um, obviously, monitor or check in. You're going to check a TEE, preferably. If you can't get it that day, I would just start with the TTE. And he doesn't have an epidural abscess, so you're not as concerned for a neurological devastate, devastating um, complication, but you need to monitor his exam carefully. Um, perineal sensation, strength, etc. You know, after the acute phase is over, you're going to uh, order a PET CT potentially to see about that biliary hematoma. Is it is it a metastatic lesion or not? He needs to see colorectal surgery, and then all after, after all of that is you know that's when you're going to start your antibiotic therapy for strep bovis. That's it. Thank you, Dr. Krakow. Um, so it looks like you're on the right track. And uh, we're going to go back to our poll real quick and kind of look at what other people have said. Um, looks like TB is really big up on the screen. Um, endocarditis, um, myeloma, strep bovis, POTS. So all right. Um, so, let's go back to. <laughs> All right. Okay, so our first follow up on this patient. So, his blood cultures grew two out of two bottles with strep sanguis, and the patient had a transthoracic echo ordered. So now we're going to invite our first expert to come and talk with us. Um, I want to introduce Dr. Mon Jokadar. So Dr. Jokadar is a cardiologist and associate professor of medicine at Emory University. He's board certified in internal medicine, cardiovascular medicine, advanced heart, um, advanced heart failure, transplantation, adult congenital heart disease, and echocardiography. He's the fellowship director for the Emory Adult Congenital Heart Disease Training Program and core curriculum director for Emory General Cardiology Fellowship Program. He graduated from University of Damascus School of Medicine in Syria and then went to Mayo Clinic in Rochester for internal medicine residency. He completed cardiology and subspecialty training here at Emory, and he's also been the recipient of numerous teaching awards, including the Golden Apple Teaching Award in 2016 and the Excellence in Teaching Award awarded by cardiology fellows here at Emory in 2015. Uh, let's welcome Dr. Jokadar. Thank you so much. Only the 
disclosure is I have Apple stock. Um, here we are. All right. I have no other disclosures. So we start out with a transthoracic echocardiogram. And is this the pointer? Here's the parasternal long axis, two dimension. And here the left ventricle, systolic function appears to be preserved. Here is the mitral valve anterior leaflet, and you see there may or may not be something right there. Yep. Oh, okay, thank you. I'll use the arrow. Can you hear me now? So here's the aortic valve, and the aortic valve appears to be thickened, and here on the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve, you see there may or may not be something right there. We'll get more images here. And here we start to see a lot of turbulence in the LVOT, in the left ventricle outflow tract. And there appears to be significant aortic valve regurgitation right there, a very broad regurgitant jet. There's also a very unusual color signal right there of mitral valve regurgitation that does not appear to arise from the usual location at the mitral valve tips. There's something else going on here. Here's a peristernal short axis view. And here are the three leaflets. It's not a bicuspid valve. It's a normal trileaflet aortic valve. And you see that there may be some thickening here of the non-coronary cusp. The rest of the valves are a little bit thickened as well, but, but I, I call attention to this area right there. Here's a four-chamber view, two dimension, and you see there is significant thickening of this aortic valve. And then with color, there's more regurgitation. Systolic function of the left ventricle and right ventricle appear to be preserved. Here in the three chamber, there is thickening of the aortic valve as well. And then here, you get a better sense that there may be something here, right there, that looks like it could be a vegetation. Hard to tell. And then with color, right in that area, there's color going through right that area, which raises the suspicion for a perforation in that anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. There is mitral valve regurgitation that is difficult to quantify. It is difficult to quantify because the, 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 it's very eccentric. So this could be mild, could be moderate, and it certainly could be severe. Very difficult, very difficult to tell. When we put our Doppler signal through the aortic valve, we can get the continuous wave Doppler of the regurgitation. Here's forward flow, and here's backward flow of the aortic valve regurgitation. And by tracing the slope, we can get an idea of what the pressure halftime is. Pressure halftime is um, a method that helps, helps us determine how quickly the pressure between two chambers is reduced in half, how quickly the gradient is cut in half. The steeper the slope in, any, in anything in echo, the steeper the slope, the more rapidly pressures equalize between two chambers. So if you have pressures equalizing quickly in diastole between the aorta and the left ventricle, that implies that there's a lot of leakage, a lot of regurgitation of that aortic valve. And this pressure halftime is less than 200 or 250, depending on the, on the cutoff. And this implies there's at least moderate, probably severe aortic valve regurgitation. We never use one single, uh, one single marker, but, but uh, we usually use multiple. And in my experience, aortic valve regurgitation is often very difficult to quantify. Here, putting the probe up on the suprasternal notch, we can see the, the, uh, uh, the arch. Here's the candy cane of the arch. Here's ascending arch and then descending. And here are the branch vessels. And then we color this area. In color, in color Doppler, BART, blue away, red toward. See all this red right there? That does not belong. There's a lot of reversal in the descending aorta, which we can actually quantify. Here's forward flow and here's backward flow, a lot of backward flow also suggestive of at least moderate, probably severe aortic valve regurgitation. So with this in mind, a transthoracic echocardiogram was, was ordered. And very briefly, 
you see that there is appears to be a vegetation right there, and there appears to be a lucency in that anterior leaflet of the mitral valve, suggestive of abscess. We'll get more views here. And here we see the perforation. Here's the color perforation of the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. See that? The, the, the coaptation zone of the mitral valve is right there. And here you have a hole right there in the mitral valve, uh, which leads to some regurgitation. Again, it is difficult to quantify. And here all this turbulence in the LVOT is suggestive of regurgitation of the aortic valve that is significant. The short axis, midesophageal short, uh, aortic short axis, and here you see thickening of the non-coronary cusp. There appears to be bulky vegetation right there. And I think there may actually be stuff on the rest of the valves too. It's hard to tell, but, but some of this wiggly stuff, for lack of a better word, very mobile uh, strands of, of, of material is suggestive of endocarditis there as well. And here is the anterior leaflet, and here's the aortic valve, bulky vegetation here. And this is the reason why the transesophageal was necessary even after a very suggestive transthoracic echo. You want to make sure you look at abscess. And here you have abscess in the tissue that is contiguous between the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve and the and the uh, aortic valve. And here you have severe regurgitation of the aortic valve with flow that fills the left ventricle outflow tract. And here again is the perforation. Just to orient you about the importance of this, this is the non-coronary cusp base of the heart, and this is the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. And it appears that you have abscess formation right there, probably with perforation of this leaflet right here and the vegetation right there. Also, I'd like to point out that the AV node lives right there. So this person is at high risk of heart block. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jokadar. Um, all right. So um, some more follow-up information. So the patient underwent aortic valve replacement and mitral valve repair. Spinal path from the aortic valve and mitral valve leaflets showed acute and chronic inflammation, bacterial endocarditis, gram-positive cocci, and the tissue culture from the aortic valve was positive for alpha hemolytic strep, and the morphology was similar to the strep sanguis they found in the blood culture. Um, some of the things that Dr. Craig had already mentioned to you guys, the positive RPR with the low titer we suspect is a false positive in the setting of bacterial endocarditis. The patient did have a syphilis IgG checked, which was negative. And as far as the SPEP and UPEP, which were sent for the globulin gap, there was no paraprotein identified and was likely abnormal due to subacute inflammation um, infection. So um, next, I'm going to introduce our second expert who's going to be talking today, um, Dr. Federico Palacio. So Dr. Palacio is an assistant professor of medicine at Emory um, in the Division of Infectious Diseases. He graduated from CES University in Columbia and then went to University of Texas Health Science Center in um, San Antonio to complete his internal medicine residency and infectious disease fellowship. He came to Emory as a medical student and then came back to us um, uh, as an attending and we're glad to have him, Dr. Palacio. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, thank you to uh, Dr. Craco, I think, for taking us to your thought process and in this interesting case uh, with a um, uh, broad differential diagnosis. I think this is the most important part of the CPC is to have that, that part. Thank you to Dr. Jokadar for the specific uh, results on the TTE and the TEE. Um, so this patient had a definitive diagnosis of infective endocarditis, and he met criteria also for the early surgical intervention. 
I was in service when uh, this patient was uh, hospitalized and uh, there were some questions that were generated when we were taking care of him. And I'm gonna talk about one of those questions today. So strep viridans, um, it's uh, had a very complicated and controversial taxonomy. Uh, they have been many changes since 1970. That was the first classification. Uh, nowadays we have new technology. So we have the 16S RNA gene um, um, expansion. So uh, they group the strep viridans uh, into more similar um, uh, species. So now we have five groups. Uh, strep sanguinis is, uh, sanguinis is one of the groups, and that's what our patient has. The previous name was uh, strep sanguinis, now it's strep sanguinis. So the word viridans come from the Latin viridis, that means green. So uh, strep viridans produce uh, partial hemolysis on the blood agar. Uh, so that's why in the, from the red blood cell destruction, you see this greenish uh, color. Um, and then they also have gamma hemolysis. There is actually no hemolysis. So you can compare here the alpha and gamma hemolysis with the beta hemolysis that is complete destructions of the cells in the blood agar. So the strep viridans, uh, they are gram-positive cocci in chains, short chains. They don't produce coagulase or catalase. Uh, until recently, the way we identified the, um, the strep virulence was by phenotypically just some physiologic and chemical reactions. Um, nowadays we have better technology, so we were using some molecular tests, but that's expensive, it's time consuming, and the turnaround time is long. So there is some old technology that is called the MALDI-TOP that just until recently we have been using in our micro labs, and this is ionization of uh, um, uh, of the molecules, and this is just to identify biomolecules, and in this case, is to identify uh, bacteria. So that's what we're using right now here in our uh, micro lab, and that's how the strep sanguis was identified here. So strep viridans, they are normal flora in the oral cavity, in the GI tract, the female genital tract. Um, they, they are probably 28 to 45% of the um, microbiota in the, in the mouth, and they are well known to produce uh, cavities and their decay and flake, especially strep mutants and strep sanguines. They also can produce other strep variants that can produce uh, gingivitis. So they're also well known because they, are, they have low virulence, um, so how they, how they can produce uh, endocarditis. So the way they produce endocarditis is by production of uh, extracellular dextran. This is uh, uh, in, this, um, in the outside of the bacteria, and they just increase addition into the um, heart valve, especially if you have valve destruction. There is, you have an increased risk of uh, uh, endocarditis. Uh, FEMAME is another protein that is outside of the bacteria that also increase addition into the uh, valves. And then when you have uh, vascular destruction, you have exposure, uh, exposure of fibronectin, and that can attach to uh, lipoteitoic acid, and that in increase inflammation, and that can uh, produce increase in the size of the uh, vegetation. They also induce uh, release of the interleukin 1B, and that produce platelet uh, aggregation. So what is the clinical presentation of um, endocarditis but strep viridans? So usually the most common uh, source is the mouth, as we say, they can produce uh, decay, plague, um, uh, but there are also descriptions of colon cancer, uh, uh, and then also from piercing is it's the other source. They usually present with constitutional symptoms. The most common one is fever, and the, the presentation is an insidious onset that is not treated, it can progress rapidly. I think this uh, correlates with, the, with our, where our patient right now. They have higher rates of valve destructions that we saw, and they have a higher rate of surgery. So because of the insidious onset, you can also see some of the immunological complex that you will see in infected endocarditis. So you can see the uh, splinter hemorrhage and the osler nodes. And this is just a picture to show you the difference between the Janowy lesions that are more as Dr. Krecker was saying, um, more in acute endocarditis, and the Osler nodes you can see more in uh, subacute endocarditis. So our patient had a, 
a positive RPR, and we think it's a false positive RPR, his triponemal test, the IgG, was negative. So there is a classification for a false positive RPR. Acute is when it's less than six months, and chronic is when it's longer than six months. So in acute, as you can see, it's more like an acute infection, acute presentation, and one of the um, etiologies that we see is endocarditis, and especially subacute endocarditis. And then on the chronic, it's more connective tissue disease, but malignancy and colon cancer have also been associated with false positives RPRs. So the question that we had when we saw these patients, is there an association between a strep uh, sanguinis or sanguis and colon cancer? So uh, as Dr. Krakow was pointing, um, I think the, the, the one association, the clinical association that we all know is between strep bovis and colon cancer. And I think I'm just gonna reinforce this because it's important to know the nomenclature and the different chains in the taxonomy. So I think the, the strep gallolyticus, subspecies gallolyticus, is the one that is uh, related with colon cancer. So what is the etiology? How uh, strep gallolyticus can produce colon cancer? So I think the most common theory is that because there is a polyp, there is a mass, uh, they can be damaged in the mucosa of the colon, and then you can have bacterial translocation um, of, the, of the bacteria, and then you will see bacteremia or endocarditis, and then you will suspect. But most recently, there have been some theories about the etiology of a strep gallolyticus in producing colon cancer. So one of the um, uh, formulations is that you can have chronic inflammation and production of cytokines, and they will produce DNA mutation, they will produce increased angiogenesis, and this can produce new cancer or can produce premalignant lesions converting to, into colon cancer. The other theory is alteration in tissue. So this is the common one that we see when you have destruction of the mucosa that you will have bacterial translocation and you will see the clinical correlation with uh, bacteremia and endocarditis. But also when there is bacterial translocation, you can see um, that there is change in the microbiota of the colon and this, this can uh, predispose to carcinogenesis. And the last one is induction of uncontrolled cellular proliferation. So there are proteins in the outside of the bacteria that have been shown that can uh, just produce uh, uncontrolled cellular proliferation and that are premalignant lesions or induce just cancer from novel. So, so what is the real association so with the strep sanguinis and colon cancer? So I did a literature uh, search. Uh, this goes from 1995 to 2010, and I was able to find seven cases. The eight case is our case um, of patients. So you can see they all were uh, older than 50 years old. They all have like constitutional symptoms. I don't know if this is from the infection or this is from the cancer. Um, only one of them had infective endocarditis. All the other patients had just uh, bacteremia. So the question is, uh, should we screen patients with virulence group streptococcus bacteremia and endocarditis for GI malignancy? So I don't think we have enough evidence right now to say that, but I think it should be in, in our minds that other streps and strep virions can also be associated with colon cancer and try to to um, educate these patients on a screening for cancer. So just in the follow-up for our patient, uh, I think uh, Dr. Kanakam already gave us an update, but so he was uh, taken to surgery and the arctic valve vegetation tissue grew two colonies of strep sanguis. Um, so the patient completed six weeks of IV ceftriaxon from the date of his surgery and he was evaluated in clinic, uh, no constitutional symptoms, his back pain resolved and he's doing um, much better now. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I think it was wonderful to Dr. Krako. Got to the answer already. <laughs> so uh, any questions from, from the other side or from here? So I have a question, like, you know, if uh, this will start with, uh, from Federico and David, like, you know, from the research you've done. So this new bacteria, which I don't want to pronounce the name and, and like, you know, be a laughing stock, that, that new Gletocus or Gleticus, you know, is this the new name for bovis? Okay, and then Sengus is part of the viridans, but how does it fit into that? David, could you tell us? Yeah. 
So, yeah, no, I think there are different groups. So the, the bovis belongs to the non-enterococcygo group D streptococcus. So they, they found with new uh, ways to diagnose that there are different categories. So it's not a strep virulence anymore. So the sanguis is a strep virulence. The, the, the group D is for the gadolidicus, that is a non-enterococcus streptococcus. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I would have thought it would be gadolidicus with the colon cancer. It turned out to be virulence which I also put on the differential, but it's interesting, Gilidicus is much lower likelihood in terms of probability causing, so virulence is a higher likelihood, all comers for endocarditis, so I guess you balance out those two thoughts, so. Any further questions? Okay, so I I had a patient with strep bovis uh, bacteremia in the past, and then when we did the literature research, turns out, uh, at least in Japan, and they kind of extrapolate this, that we were always taught that strep bovis is associated with colon cancer, which it is, but the majority of cases with strep bovis bacteremia, from what I remember, are associated with biliary and other GI disease, just, just based on prevalence of those diseases. What is it about uh, strep bovis that uh, makes it so specifically associated with colon cancer? You gave sort of a range of possible, you know, kind of mechanisms by which it induces or contributes to, you know, kind of kind of that process. But it's something where it's hard to pull that apart from a lot of the bacteria that potentially could be floating around in that environment. Is it particularly inflammatory? Does it have some sort of particular, you know, kind of special characteristic about it that, you know, lends itself to being a more, um, you know, kind of either virulent or um, pro-carcinogenic? Um, you know, Dr. Palacio went over some of that. I can say that strep bovis, you know, it's four, actually four bacterium in the strep bovis group. Gadolidicus is the one that causes endocarditis. It has an encapsulated uh, cell surface, so it's more sticky and it evades, uh, uh, you know, the immune system. But why strep, you know, I don't know if you want to speak to why strep, the strep bovis itself is so pathogenic, so. So I think there are right now only theories. I don't think there is something specific, but one, I think was this three path that I think I, I'd show you in the, so the inflammation with chronic inflammation, so DNA mutations and angiogenesis, and then the change in the microbiota but I think those are all theories, and there are just a lot of um, animal models and in vitro data. I don't think we have a specific uh, response to that, but it's being associated more with the etiology and not just the clinical association of seeing the bacteremia with colon cancer. That, that's what I don't know what happened with sanguine, is if, if there is some etiology or there's just a clinical um, association with it. Then just a, a brief comment. I think it's a little easier to remember the Galoliticus name if you just think about it as a, a strep chicken exploder. Great. Yep. I think we have another question. Yes. Uh, the weight loss of 100 pounds in two months, can we attribute that to both the endocarditis as well as the colon cancer? And also the mass that was there in the paraspinal area of L1, L2, was that an abscess? I do think it explains the entire picture, the 100-pound weight loss. When you think of weight loss, there was no uh, diarrhea for malabsorption, no signs of hyperthyroidism, so it's probably decreased PO intake, and uh, we have no other explanation. That would be inflammatory tissue, whether it's a frank abscess or not. That paraspinal infection was probably abscess-like, and uh, again, it's treated, it sounds like it was treated supportively with, with antibiotics, and he did well. Uh, another question I had in mind, if uh, nobody has any question. I don't know from the other sides we have any questions. Oh, that question. So, Man, I had a question from you. So, I think we as hospitalists you know, come across this issue all the time, like TTE versus TEE. 
and I know it's a, it's a vague area, but I, we normally start with TTE. This is a high-risk patient, right? What is the utility of TTE in this case? I know like, it's hard to go back, and, but I'd like to hear from cardiology perspective, like how you guys see that. And second thing is you said that abscess, and that's why we should do TEE. So guide us to like, you know why that is important. So TTE, transthoracic echo, transesophageal echo, are for two separate things. Purely for endocarditis, the sensitivity of a transthoracic echo is approximately 75%, depending on your pretest, your pretest uh, uh, characteristics of the patient. But all, in average, it's about 75%, about 90% specific or so. A transesophageal echo is much higher in sensitivity and much higher in specificity. So it makes, it makes sense to go straight for the transesophageal echo. I will tell you that quantification of abnormalities, quantification of ventricular function, quantification of pulmonary pressures, quantification of uh, chamber dilation is much more uniform and standard in a transthoracic echo. So I would, I would argue to start with a transthoracic echo almost always, unless it's an emergency, unless you have, but usually you can do, you can do combined transthoracic, transesophageal. Hello? Got cut off. <laughs> so, so I would argue to start with a transthoracic echo most of the time to answer more of the structural, functional abnormalities, and then go uh, next with the transesophageal. The reason why, if you see endocarditis on a transthoracic, that the appropriate step is to then go to a transesophageal is for this issue of, per issue of perivalvular abscess. A perivalvular abscess is an emergency, surgical emergency. And uh, you know the dogma, the teaching, is that you should go straight for surgery as soon as possible if you have an abscess. Uh, I don't think that's entirely written in stone, but it is, it is one of the, one of the uh, things that, that we've been taught and, and mostly true. If you have an abscess, you have a very high risk of disintegration of the heart, of heart block, of, uh, of uh, life-threatening life -threatening immediate complications. So that's the reason for TEE after TTE. T -T -E. All right, thank you very much. Um, Jeff, we have heard any questions or, okay, all right. So thank you so very much. Again, our presenters, you know, Haritha, David Krako, um, Federico, and Man, thank you so very much for joining us. It was a pleasure.